If you have your Bibles with you or if you have a mobile device and uh, you want to have the text for you, we'll be looking at John chapter 2, the first miracle that Jesus performed. It's an interesting study in a lot of different ways. And it's just one of those studies I enjoy periodically coming back and looking at the miracles of Jesus. And for the next few weeks, we'll take a journey through the miracles of Jesus and hopefully shed some light that will spark your enthusiasm for your love for the Lord and what he was about and what he is about as he lives this day. But if you're looking at the text, let's just, I'm going to throw up the first two verses on the screen in a modern English for you. Three days later, let me stop there, three days later than what? Well, if you go back into chapter one, Jesus has been busy calling his followers and those that would become eventually the apostles. And so there's stories there uh, about who Jesus calls. And then he heads toward Galilee where this miracle of turning the water into wine is going to take place. And so it just says, you know, three days later, later than what? Later than the choosing of his disciples. Because as you look at the text, you find out that there's a wedding feast and Jesus and his disciples have been invited to it. There's all sorts of things that, when you think about that, you know, I don't know, again, how you grew up and what you were taught about Jesus. But when I read a text like this, I find out that Jesus was very much a part of life. He enjoyed life. He enjoyed the things that took place in life. He enjoyed being with people. He could enjoy going to a wedding feast. He could enjoy the occasion of of what this meant to the village that he was going to. His disciples are going with him. When Jesus begins his ministry, and that's what we're dealing with in starting in chapter one of John, Jesus has begun his ministry. He's at, you know, 30 to 33 years old. And, and he's called these others to come with him. And for the next three and a half years, they will travel together, they'll eat together, they will enjoy life together. They'll laugh, they'll cry, they'll just, all that's going on in life, they will all participate in. And throughout this journey, Jesus uses this journey of three, three and a half years to share the message that he's come to give. A message that speaks of faith, a message that speaks of hope, a message that speaks of love. And he comes giving that message. And he understands in the giving of this message what he wants to take place is he desires of what God has always desired, that we all be saved and none be lost. And so th this is what you find happening, but it's so significant to me. You know, John starts out his gospel in such a serious light. He says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And then a few verses down, he will write, and the word became flesh, talking about Jesus becoming like us. Jesus walking this earth as a person, as flesh and blood, as someone having emotions and feelings as we have, knowing the emotion of being hungry, knowing the emotion of, of wanting to have a pillow to put his head down at night. You know, all these emotions that we talk about, Jesus, that was all part of who Jesus was as he walked this earth in flesh and blood. But anyway, he comes to this wedding feast. It's one that he's been invited to. Through this, we'll be talking somewhat about the, the cultural wedding feast. There, there are three things I want you to grasp about a wedding that would take place. I've done, uh, I, I really never kept count. I, I, once I got past somewhere around a thousand, I quit keeping count of the number of weddings I've done in 50 plus years. But as I think about them, I've seen weddings that are just very simple. Uh, I've been in weddings out in the middle of nowhere to perform a ceremony. Uh, just unique things that have happened in weddings. I've seen people spend basically nothing more than buying the license so that they could legally be married. 
to the point of seeing weddings and being involved in weddings that I knew cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So I've seen a little bit of everything in weddings. And when you think about a wedding in that day, and you're thinking in terms of not metropolitan area, but the wedding feast that Jesus has gone to is in a village. It's maybe two or 300 people. For weddings in that day, when they took place in small villages, they were weddings that were celebrated in unique ways. It was indeed a celebration, a celebration where everybody stopped what they were doing. What's significant? What day of the week did most weddings take place in the day of Jesus? Do you know? Anybody want to venture a guess? It's not Saturday, not Sunday, it's not Monday. Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> I, I knew I'd get an I knew I'd get an answer somewhere. The wedding feast would happen, and it would start being prepared. The final preparations on Wednesday, and ultimately, the wedding itself would happen late Wednesday night. One of the things that that you think about, you know, normally when you think of weddings, uh, you think in different terms of what that period of time was about. Everybody had to be busy every day of their lives meeting the daily needs of life. You didn't have a Kroger or a Myers to go to. You didn't have stores open 24 hours. You got up at sunup, and you went, you went home. You were home by sundown. So the wedding took place in the evening. It's just like when you begin to talk about a time to worship, the only real time that we know about that they worship is found in Acts 20 when they met at night and you got a guy that falls out of the window and uh, goes to sleep. He's tired from day's work. And we find that he's healed. Uh, so you're going to find so much of what happened did happen at night when it came to celebrations and activities because no one had a day off. You're not talking about a 40-hour work week. You're talking about having to live by what you brought home. You went to the market early in the morning, outdoor market if you've ever been to one. You picked out what you needed and you took it home. No refrigeration. He didn't have ways to, to keep things as we have today. And so the celebration usually began on a Wednesday night. Not always, but usually the, the actual celebration would start Wednesday night. And it was a celebration that would last for a whole week. And groom did not go on a honeymoon. They stayed home. They not only stayed home, they had an open house. Now, some of you, you got to, the wheels are turning, aren't they? <laughs> no honeymoon, no getting away from the village. Someone there all the time. People coming and going, celebrating, enjoying the time. I mean, you're not talking about a place where there were going to be, well, Valentine's Day is coming up. Uh, we had one Valentine's uh, uh, here as a congregation where we did five ceremonies on that one day on Valentine's. And uh, the four or five people that helped me do that made me promise never to do it again. <laughs> and that was really kind of tough because we didn't finish till about eight o'clock that Valentine's night. So it was a long day, but people want to get married. And sometimes we'll have a number of, of weddings taking place. Uh, days of uh, especially when you get into June you know, on a Saturday you can drive around and find several weddings taking place at different venues it, this is not what was happening then this is a small village a wedding you didn't have one every day it was a time where everybody got together and they celebrated they enjoyed the moment it was a time away from the day-to-day -day routine. It was a time to break away. And so for a, for a week, there would be that open house and the bride and groom would be there to welcome, to enjoy. 
people's company. So it was a different experience. Hospitality, and we talk a lot about this. Matter of fact, when you get into the understanding of the early church, one of the things that they asked of a leadership of an early church was that in those congregations, were those being chosen to lead, were they hospitable? Hospitality was a crew, a, a, a very important ingredient to all that took place. Being hospitable, providing, opening. You know, it, it was not uncommon in a small village that when darkness set in, if a family had a few animals, you know, a couple of goats, whatever, that they actually brought them into their house. And it was not uncommon to keep them close to the door. The doors were not locked. People could walk in. So it was not, it, it's a whole different atmosphere. And if someone showed up in the middle of the night saying they were hungry, you get out of the bed and, and gave them something to eat. It was those practices of hospitality right. under all circumstances. That's why when you read through the stories that Jesus, of Jesus' life and the, the parables and the miracles they do, you'll see thoughts about hospitality being demonstrated. You'll find Jesus, whether it's uh, teaching a parable or performing a miracle, many times in the house, someone's house, and that anyone in the village would be there. People would come. You just opened the doors. And you made sure that everybody had something to eat or drink. Right. So you, you've got three things that would normally take place. Usually the wedding would be on a Wednesday. It would be a wedding, last a celebration for a week, open house type celebration. And hospitality was the sacred duty of those hosting the wedding. Now where does that take us? Well, let's go to starting in verse 3. And I'm going to only pull one verse out on the screen. It's verse 6. Now, standing there were six stone water jars used for the Jewish rites of, pur of purification, each one holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now, let me kind of help you with the rest of the verses at time. One of the things that people always like to discuss about this turning the water into wine is the relationship of Mary and Jesus. One of the things that you need to always do when you see a conversation in scripture taking place between whoever, quit trying to decipher that conversation in terms of 2020. <laughs> You've got to think back one of the things I just did with you, I took you back in time and said, here are the things that would normally happen in a village on a wedding. Because it's not what we would do. Today a couple gets married, you'll have some type of reception or dinner, and then they take off on their honeymoon and nobody bothers them from the island. That's not the way things worked in the first century. It's a different time. Yep. And when people spoke, one of the things that you have trouble with is, you cannot hear the tone, the emotions in a conversation. Now at times the Holy Spirit will, will bring in and describe an emotion to you. But even then you're not there. So at times you, you've got to do something that, that a lot of people don't seem to want to do anymore. And that is you've got to step back, look at the text and ask what is factual here. Not what I think, not what I envision, not what I dream. So in, in this story, you've got these water pots, jars. Those are very common. Why are they common? Well, first of all, the shoes that you would have worn would have been simple sandals in that day, which is primarily, and, and I don't have a better way to describe it than a piece of leather attached to the bottom of your foot. So that meant your feet were dirty. Well, that's an issue. Because when you went to eat, there were not tables and chairs. Mainly when you came to the table to eat, you laid on your left arm and your feet stuck out. 
and the next person feet would stay. In other words, your feet were actually close to the next person. Now, if some of you did what I did growing up or going to college selling shoes, you understand what a smelly adventure this would have been. <laughs> it was not uncommon to wash feet. Matter of fact, one of the rules of hospitality were that you made sure you not only washed the feet, but you washed the arms. And he identifies this as a Jewish rite of purification. There were rules on how you would, for instance, wash your hands. And there were rules if you were exceptional in wanting to be purified, there were additional steps of washing. There would be the washing down, but there was also the washing up. So there, there were all sorts of things involved in these washing practices. So it wasn't just the feet. It was also the hands and the arm. It could also be the face. So th there were a lot of rituals that went into this. So when you walk in, there were always water jars. One of the significant things here is, why did John say there were six water jars? Remember, this is the rite of purification. In a Jewish thought pattern, of that day, the number of things had symbolism of it. Six was always the number of that which was imperfect. The water jars are six of them because to be right before God under those rituals, you had to do the washing. The six spoke of the imperfection. The water spoke of that which God gave us to be taken out of the jars of imperfection and used on the body so that you could be purified in the presence of God. There's symbolism there. Right. And, and so you don't think that way, do you? Not a bit, you know. If you walk in and you're going to be somewhere to eat with somebody at their home, you know, they're probably going to point, well, the bathroom's down the hall, go wash your hands, <laughs> you know. Or today, what do we have sitting around? If you go in any hospital, what do you define? Hanging on the wall everywhere is what? Sanitizer. Sanitizer. Yep. We, we practice certain things, but it's not, it's not about being pure in the presence of God. It's strictly a health issue with us. For the Jewish rites of purification also had implication of your relationship with God. So these jars are sitting there. And I appreciate John sharing with us that, that this is not, you know, you know, a pint jar, the gallons of water, the purification. And this is a wedding feast, which meant that it was open to the whole village. You had to make sure there was plenty of water available because everybody was going to, feet was going to be washed, legs, I mean, arms and hands and, and even the face were going to be washed. It just depending on how strong you were within that, in the Jewish purification rites that they practice. What happens in the story, and I'll go back to Mary now. Mary and Joseph, or Mary and Jesus, are going to have a conversation. Let me point out to you, when you start out reading this story, you find that three days later, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary is introduced here. Kind of, there's always somebody that was making sure that the preparations were there for the wedding. It appears that, at least in my thinking as I look at this, Mary has a part in the preparation. Maybe she was the wedding coordinator, I don't know. <laughs> but she was there, and when the wine ran out, it's Mary that jumps to action, which tells me that she has a prominent role in this. And of course, depending on which commentary that you wanna pick up and read, there's all sorts of things that go into play here about, well, whose wedding is it? Well, the fact is we don't know whose wedding it is. The fact that I have here is that for whatever reason, and I can only put my own emotions here, for whatever reason, which it's not identified by John, Mary is concerned about there not being enough wine. They have run out of wine. She confronts or goes to Jesus 
and says, can you do something about it? And, and again, as I read this text, I don't read it like some people do. I see a person that, for whatever reason, has a responsibility. I don't know if there were extra guests that showed up. I don't know if, if someone just did not do their job. I don't know why they ran out of wine. But Mary's concerned about it. And she ultimately, she says to those who are responsible for serving the wine, says, whatever Jesus tells you to do, you do it. Which tells you that she has some authority. Otherwise, why would they have done it? This wasn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't go to Jesus. It, it's Mary dealing with this situation. And then Jesus coming into play to do the miracle that takes place here. Again, pick out your commentary, depending on what Bible app you want to use, and you'll find all sorts of discussions on why this was done. I'm going to introduce some, some thoughts to you here. Three things I want you to consider about this. The first is, when Jesus changed the water to wine, he saved a very humble family. Remember I said there are rules of hospitality? Running out of wine was a sacred sin. I know it's kind of dumb to say it that way. But I'm trying to bring home the point to you. Man, you just did not do this. This is a wedding. This was important. This showed that you cared about not only those getting married, but you also were concerned about everybody coming. And you made sure everybody was taken care of. Those were the rules of hospitality. Not to practice good hospitality was to be shunned by the village. Not to practice hospitality was considered a disgrace. And for some, it would have been considered you didn't do what God wanted you to do. That's how strong the feelings were. So you've got to understand, here's a family that's hosting this marriage feast it's bride and groom, everything's being prepared. It's about celebrating their way, not to have what was needed to demonstrate the rules of good hospitality would have been unforgivable. What does Jesus do? He steps up, turns the water into not just any wine, but you find that those there, the ones that are tasting it, immediately say, that is the best wine I've ever tasted. Amen. That's right. Then on top of that, why? You know, this is so different to what we've experienced. We have now seen where you normally serve the best wine first so that everybody gets a little bit of the good and then you bring in the cheap stuff. <laughs> this is one of those times where you serve the cheap first and you gave the best last. I don't know how else to explain that, but you can follow that a lot easier. I love this. When this comes over on the radio, I can imagine somebody listening to it saying, that is a weird preacher. <laughs> Second is the change. Water into wine. This, to me, reading 2,000 years after Jesus, it gives me a picture of Jesus that I love. You see, to me, it's not about the water to wine. It's about Jesus taking the jugs of water that were supposed to be for purification, changing them from water to something greater because of the celebration. That's right. The water that was used to wash your feet in, it's Jesus now changing it to something that everybody has to step back and say, I've never seen anything like this before. Amen. But isn't that what Jesus came to do? That's right. To remove all sin? Hallelujah. Did he not come to conquer death? That's right. Did he not come to teach us how to live in a way that would make a difference? Did he not come to tell us the greatest of all things is loving God and loving others? Did he not come to teach us about that we're called to serve and not to be served? 
you know, all of a sudden you begin to think that Jesus was changing people's minds. He was changing their attitudes. They were changing all that was taking place. And to take this purification rites, changing it into something that no one expected, to me is more about who Jesus is, that he came to change life. But more important than even that is why I put the last two things on the screen for you. Grace unlimited. Jesus had power to do anything he wanted to do. He could have turned that water into the, the cheapest wine possible, but he turned in the best. He could have said, okay, we got six jars. We don't need that much wine. Let's just do it with, you know, you're talking, okay, if it's 30 gallons and you got six of them, that's 180 gallons of wine. How many places have you ever gone where there's 180 gallons of wine being served? And if that was a village of only 200, 300 people, that's almost a gallon a person. All of a sudden it dawns on you what Jesus is doing. He took that which was there and made an abundance. Doesn't this fit what he taught later on in John 10 when he says, I've come to life and to give it to you abundantly? I didn't come to give you a sample. I came to give you something great. I came to give you what no one else could give to you. I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, says Jesus. And all of a sudden in this wedding feast, you begin to see all the teaching of Jesus. But most of all, I'm seeing a Lord that says, I will not give you a little grace. I will give you grace unlimited. When I hang on that cross and I say, forgive them, he doesn't put a but in there. Forgive them, but if they do this, don't. He doesn't do that. Jesus came to forgive any and all sin, past, present, and future. So when I see this miracle, and I don't get into the conversation, whether well was it, you know, did he did he make fermented or unfermented wine? I don't really care. <laughs> what I hear is a message of a Lord who's what I give to you is beyond measure. What I do is greater than you can envision. What I've come to do is to make changes. So Jesus calls us. He calls us to make a difference as he made a difference. That's what I see in this miracle. I'm not going to pick it to death. I'm not going to try to explain everything because I didn't live 2,000 years ago. But what I do know as Jesus made a difference, we are called to make a difference. For he says, be the light and be the salt. Be the ones who bring flavor to life. Bring the ones that bring a joy. William did the song recently, I've got the joy down in my heart. Old kid's song. Isn't that a great song to remember? I've got the joy down in my heart. Why? Because I've been given grace unlimited. I have been given that which I need so that I can come into the presence of my God. I don't need water out of a jar. I have what Jesus gives me is his grace unlimited.